If you're interested in a career in genetics, I highly recommend checking out KGI's Master in Human Genetics and Genetic Counseling program in Claremont, California. KGI emphasizes interprofessional collaboration, systematic problem solving, the safe, efficient, and ethical uses of biotechnology, and personalized patient care. This is all accomplished through a variety of experiences, including rigorous didactic coursework, clinical training, research preparation, and supplementary activities such as case conferences, grant rounds, journal clubs, and seminars. The KGI program has established affiliations with multiple genetic centers throughout Southern California, which offer access to tremendous resources for clinical, industry, and laboratory experiences, and provide a culturally dynamic and enriching environment for genetic counseling students. KGI is dedicated to the education of innovative genetic counselor who will serve the needs of individual patients, the healthcare system, and the bioscience industry. You can learn more about the program at kgi.edu slash DNA today. Again, that's kgi.edu slash DNA today. How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. I'm also a certified genetic counselor practicing in the prenatal space. On this show, we explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in genetics, experts like genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, and patient advocates. This episode is an edited recording of the Clubhouse meeting myself and Dina Goldberg, aka Dina DNA, hosted on August 26th last week, where we explored making the most of your genetic counseling grad school experience. Since this was recorded on Clubhouse, the audio is not as high quality as our other episodes. However, there's really great content. Welcome, everybody. I'm Dina or Dina DNA, and I'm a board certified genetic counselor and content creator. And today we are going to be talking uh, with current incoming genetic counseling students, current grad students, previous grad students, and um, there'll be probably be some prospective grad students as well. And it's all about managing life, managing time, managing everything that has to do with your grad school genetic counseling experience. So now let's uh, introduce uh, my co-host and then our guest panelist. My name is Kira Deneen. I am a prenatal genetic counselor, also board certified like Dina, and I practice in prenatal. I'm also the producer and host of DNA Today, which is a genetics podcast. And you know, coming from the genetic counseling perspective, I have a lot of fellow genetic counselors on. We have multiple episodes talking about grad school, um, episodes 87, 97, 101, just to, to name a few. Um, so looking forward to answering your questions. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rachel Mills, and I'm an assistant professor with the UNC Greensboro Genetic Counseling Program. Um, and I serve as the research and capstone coordinator. So I get to advise all of our students on their capstone and thesis projects. And I graduated a long time ago um, in 2008 from the UNC Greensboro program. I'm Katie Lee, CGC, or Katherine Hornberger, as I'm otherwise known. And I'm a reproductive genetic counselor. I'm currently working at Seattle Sperm Bank. I'm a graduate from the University of Colorado genetic counseling program. And this year I started a couple YouTube channels, one for aspiring genetic counselors just to share resources about how to apply and how to apply maybe more efficiently to grad school programs. And then one related to my personal experience and my work in fertility genetics um, and genetic counseling. My name is Alejandra. I am a incoming first year for Sarah Lawrence College and um, I have been working the last few years. So this will be my first time going back to school in five years. Uh, my biggest concern is how to go back into the habit of studying and preparing for coursework after being out of school for so long. I think for people that have been out of school for a little bit, it can be tough to get back into the rhythm. But I think reminding yourself of the study strategies that you used to use and bringing that back in, I would say also I mean, Alejandro, you're so great at this. Other people can follow lead on looking at genetic resources. So listening to podcasts, checking out GC chat on Twitter, and just seeing what are some of the topics that are really coming up a lot in genetic counseling, and maybe just reading up on those. 
um, just introducing yourself back into the world. Um, I know a lot of programs have summer reading, so a certain book, and that can also be helpful of just getting into the mindset of reading a book that maybe isn't a textbook, but a genetic book in some kind, maybe a nonfiction, um, and getting yourself back into that mindset of studying. And I think once you're a couple weeks into it, it'll all come back, just like riding a bike. You'll be like, oh, that's right. I used to do things this way. Um, so it's definitely nerve wracking. I took a year between undergrad and grad. So something to just be thinking about, but there's also going to be a lot of other people in your situation because I found that most people do not go straight from undergrad. Um, so you're going to be in the same boat as a lot of other people. And it's nice to connect with them early on in grad school and see what they're doing for study skills as well. Yeah. And I would like to echo uh, what Kara said about getting back into the habit of studying by reading um, a textbook or something like that, finding something low stakes that still feels like studying um, to just get you back in the groove. Um, at UNC Greensboro, we have a week long orientation before the start of class. Um, and during that time, we uh, re-review medical terminology and we revisit um, some of the like the uh, books of uh, I don't know, like fiction or nonfiction books that are more from patient perspectives to kind of get you in that mindset of caring for patients and um, invoking empathy and things like that. So if you have some kind of low stakes activities that you can do in these next couple of weeks before classes really start going, that'll get you back in the groove of things. So it's not quite a shock <laughs> whenever you get in your first day of class. And I'll be honest, I was not a great undergraduate student by any means. Like my study skills were pretty poor. Class attendance, not great. But I think when you get into a grad school that you've been planning for and dreaming about for years, um, you're, you're going to you know, get right into the swing of it because you are really going to be motivated to excel and to do well and you're going to enjoy what you're learning about. So I didn't find the transition to be as hard as I thought it might be knowing that I probably didn't have the best study skills coming in. And the other thing is if you're not someone who can sit down and read all the time, like I myself, I do Audible. I prefer Audible. And a lot of, most of these books are on Audible. So um, that can also get you kind of in the swing of things because you can be doing chores or driving and be able to get, um, be able to listen to a lot of these stories, which can be so helpful in your training. Yeah. So we have other previously submitted questions. Um, the next one is I think a topic that's been brought up a lot in the last couple of years in the genetic counseling community, how can you avoid burnout as a genetic counseling student? And I'm going to expand that to even when you're starting out in the career, been in the career a while. I actually had a student um, from the class of 2020 that did her capstone project related to things like mindfulness and burnout. Um, and one of the interesting findings, um, she surveyed uh, genetic counseling students and she found that self-care things that required a lot of time and a lot of activity, things like running, things like seeing a therapist, um, those things dropped off. They decreased um, once students started their graduate program. And with that, some things like mindfulness and, and personal reflection, those things kind of increased. Um, but with us seeing this drop off of some of the things that really help us kind of get out of our own minds, um, and build up energy and things like that are the ones that we see drop off. And so my recommendation is to schedule self-care. Um, that sounds somewhat counterintuitive to have to schedule something like that, but with your busy genetic counseling training program, especially in the second year when you start to do things like clinical rotations, Having a set time that is devoted to whatever you like to do to take care of yourself is going to help you get out of that burnout. Um, I think especially right now, our students are feeling a much higher level of burnout than they've ever felt before because of the last year and a half that we've been in. So it's extremely important right now to focus on the self-care piece. One of the things that I would do with friends in the program is, you know, we go out and we start talking about, you know, oh, I had this case or talking about this class and this and that. 
And after a little bit, we'd say, all right, now there's a rule. We can't talk about anything related to genetic counseling, which can be a challenge when you're with other genetic counselors. Um, but I think that that can sometimes be good because then you find out other things you have in common with your classmates um, and just seeing like what other things you can talk about and just giving yourself a break from it. Yeah. And I think just to follow up with that, uh, if anybody has done just a little bit of research into the field of genetic counseling, as you guys have been applying and considering this as a career, you know that the rates of burnout are really high in genetic counselors because of the the type of work that we do and how much of that of ourselves we pour into that work. And so I think it's really, really important to establish those good self-care practices right now while you're in school so that you can continue and build upon those practices once you get in into your genetic counseling career, once you get into your day-to-day work um, and the stresses that come with that. Yeah, I also uh, think that it's really important to nurture relationships outside of grad school because a lot of times we can get stuck in our um, in every in our world of grad school because there's so much going on and you're really talking to the same group of people and you all of a sudden have all this in common with all the people that are in your program, um, but it can be really helpful to also. Uh, attempt to try and spend time with people both outside your program. And then if you are moving, like for me, I moved from my program and I didn't know anybody in the area. And I um, joined some different community to, to some different community groups to be able to make friends and, and being able to hang out with them was a really good kind of mental escape from um, from all the, uh, the, the talk, kind of like Kira was saying, sp- take turning it off. It, that was helpful. And I think one other thing to mention that hasn't been said yet is to be open to trying therapy. I tried therapy for the first time while I was in grad school um, during one of my most stressful rotations where I really felt like the pressure was on and my thesis project was due. And it was so helpful just to have someone to reflect my feelings to and not feel like I was just constantly complaining to my partner and my good friends. And it really helps. So I'd encourage that to be a tool to keep in the toolkit. Yeah. And if I can build from that, um, from like a programmatic perspective, the majority of colleges and universities now have um, counseling services on campus that are free or reduced cost for students. And so if you do find yourself in a situation where you feel like you might benefit from that, check with your program director about the services that are available. Um, Check your university or your college's website um, to find out what things are ready and easily accessible for you right there on campus. And another thing is, um, so we, you want to keep your physical health, your emotional health, your spiritual health, um, all of these as healthy as you can and as balanced as you can. And yeah, I think that's a really good point, Dina. And just looking at it from all the different perspectives of ways that you can decrease your stress, decrease your anxiety, but validate when you do have those feelings come up. Catherine, you were saying um, earlier that rotations can be stressful and there's a lot of different components to that. Um, We had a previously submitted question that asked about this. um, And just in terms of what someone can expect in starting grad school, what does that first rotation look like? How quickly are students expected to jump into sessions? Some people may have no idea what that can look like. Yeah, my first rotation, our program director called it like a get your feet wet rotation. And I remember the first couple, it was just shadowing for the first couple of weeks. Um, ours was structured that we'd be in the clinic for the afternoon. We had classes in the morning and I was just shadowing. I didn't do anything. And then maybe the next two weeks we took pedigrees or family trees and the genetic counselor that was leading the session was also taking her own pedigree or family tree. So we would check them afterwards and then slowly, um, they might hand over some more responsibilities depending on the type of patient that was coming each time. Um, If it was an easier patient or an easier indication, maybe I'd be comfortable taking more. But generally, the genetic counselors were really understanding that it was your very first rotation. And, you know, they want you to feel comfortable as well. So they'd see what you feel comfortable taking on depending on the specific indication. So I'd say at my program, it was a very, like, a slow pitch into genetic counseling and it felt pretty comfortable 
as far as as far as it goes. I mean, of course, you're still nervous, but it, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too scary. And I was I knew what to expect from my supervisor. And I think that's a lot of people's experience of just starting out with just observing, doing your own pedigree as the genetic counselors, doing theirs. Um, so I had really very similar experience to you. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think that this is um, an important question to also ask your program director or whoever it is in your program that helps set up the clinical rotations. Things are a little different at UNCG because we actually have our students do um, some of the observation types of things during their first year. So sitting in with clinic sessions, practicing the pedigrees alongside the, um, the genetic counselor, a lot of that stuff happens during these observations that we do in the first year so that the first rotation, which for us happens in the summer, um, it really is only a couple of days of those kind of like observation introduction type of things before the students jump right in. Um, and I remember my first summer rotation, uh, it was a prenatal rotation. And by the end of it, I was actually doing screening counseling by myself for some of the like low risk. Um, they were actually, uh, do, they would do um, second trimester screening um, for all patients that came in, regardless of what their risk was. So I would take care of those um, as, a, as a student learner. Um, so I think that there's a lot of variability between programs. And so checking in with your faculty and with your supervisors about what are the expectations and what should you be prepared for is going to be really helpful to make sure that you're comfortable and that you're moving at the pace that you feel comfortable with. And that is also kind of expected based on the growth. Yeah, I actually really wanted to echo what Katie was saying earlier about um, thinking about therapy within grad school. In my first year, I felt like that was something that was really useful for me. Um, and I actually did go through my program uh, or the um, I, I'm currently at the University of Minnesota and they actually do have those resources. So definitely reach out to the counseling services that um, are available through your school. So definitely wanted to echo that. Um, and then in regards to the current conversation um, about just rotations and things, um, I absolutely have a similar experience to, experience to a lot of people. Um, but I will say that one thing that I did not anticipate going into rotations was that um, our first year were primarily virtual and we did all of our courses and suddenly we were going in uh, person for a clinic. So that was kind of a uh, drastic change for me personally. So that's something that I didn't anticipate. So um, would love to hear other people's thoughts on how that transition process might be in other programs or what sort of help people um, get used to that. And maybe Janelle could jump in in terms of she's coming from Sarah Lawrence perspective. She's the admission directors there. Um, and so, Janelle, I don't know if you want to share just how Sarah Lawrence has handled and what you've seen with other programs with switching some things now from virtual to hybrid. Hi, everyone. Yeah. In terms of mental health, um, there is counseling service services um, available at, at Sarah Lawrence. And so some individuals took it upon themselves to um take advantage of that just based on whatever was going on in their life at the time. And then there are other individuals where there are, were events that occurred in their lives while they were attending the program. And so based on, so we have a, a mentor program at Sarah Lawrence where all each student is partnered with a program director, um, at kind of like, just kind of like checking in on them, making sure that they're okay throughout the year. And so, Sometimes when those check-ins happen, everything's, everything's fine. <laughs> There's nothing really going on, but you're just building up a foundation. So that way, if something should occur, um, you have that person that you can talk to. So we, we serve as a support system. So if something is going on, we can tell course lecturers and, and, and other people that things may be a little bit different for the student. And what can we do to try and support the student through this time in their lives. And sometimes that includes recommending that they do see someone who can help them um, with counseling on, on campus. Um, and then in, in terms of the, what is it like to get your clinical experience while in school? Um, we, we have, it's been an evolving process for us, but now we, we officially have what they call um, simulated patients. And so Interestingly enough, the first year is actually like 
practice with the second years in terms of like, you know, practice being a genetic counselor before they get, they get into clinic. And then after the practicing with the second years, they then um, work with the simulated patients. And then one of the program directors serves as like the supervisor to, to watch them carry out that session with the simulated patient. And then at, only after that do they then enter into the actual clinical space with, with genetic counselors and do the observational and then eventually their summer into their second year. Yeah, we also use simulated patients at UNCG during the first year. And I think the combination of the simulated patients plus like the observations and things helps build up, build up that confidence so that once they're actually in a clinical setting um, during their first rotation, they feel, they kind of feel ready and excited to jump in um, and to not uh, spend the most of the rotation doing more like observation things. Our students are ready to jump in and try it out. And I think that the, um, the observation opportunities that happen in the first year help build that confidence. I graduated from KGI's program in May, and now I'm a prenatal GC. I just wanted to add on to the kind of rotation discussion um, because, you know, at, at KGI, I, I, we had amazing leadership who was, who was very supportive and, and, you know, very good at kind of outlining where they thought that we should be um, in each of our rotations. But all of the supervisors were still very different in their approach. Um, so, you know, in my third or fourth rotation, I, I had kind of a thing happen where I was getting really good feedback and it was a really difficult rotation, but, but, you know, everything was going well. And then kind of in the mid rotation evaluation, she said, actually, I don't think you are where you need to be. And I was really kind of taken aback by that. And, you know, it, it ended up fine, but it taught me that, you really have to, you know, talk to your supervisors at the beginning and kind of set what their expectations are you are for you as well. Um, because sometimes it doesn't always align with the programs, um, especially if they're newer supervisors. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So setting expectations sounds like um, that is definitely important. Preparing for a career in genetic counseling? Check out Keck Graduate Institute in Claremont, California. At KGI, you will gain the training and development to become an innovative, collaborative, and caring genetic counselor. KGI prepares graduates to be leaders among healthcare professionals dedicated to the delivery of advanced, personally optimized patient care and the translation of applied and clinical science breakthrough to enhance the quality of life. So if you want to be a genetic counselor, check out KGI at kgi.edu slash DNA today. Again, that's kgi.edu slash DNA today. Hi, everyone. Um, I just had a really quick question just before I kind of moved on to another topic. I wanted to backtrack for a second about I, the topic of burnout, because I know that's something that kind of came up and was discussed by a few people. So um, as someone who's pro I'm pros uh, applying um, uh, prospectively this year slash next year, um, in as I prepare for that process, and I've obviously, as many of you have mentioned, you know, there are sources and articles out there about the high level of burnout with GCs. So that raises my question of when I go to select programs or when I eventually end up in a program, what are ways that I can kind of maximize finding um, different niches or different um, opportunities within programs to kind of, uh, if I do face burnout as a future GC, to add something new to my um, kind of roundhouse of skills to kind of revitalize um, my profession or the way that I'm practicing um, as a counselor? I think that's a great question, Noah. And since this is something on the forefront of your mind as you are considering where you're going to be applying, I think that that's a really important question to ask of the programs that you're applying to um, or that you're considering applying to. Um, and much in the same way that you might ask a program, what are your rotation site options? And do you do a thesis or a capstone? You can tackle the question of what sorts of resources um, and skills does the program teach related to um, mindfulness, um, self-awareness, and things that can help me prevent burnout. I, I think that that's a great question to ask programs. Um, and I think once you're in a program is to continue asking that question, continue requesting those resources. Um, I, I think a lot of times, the resources may lie outside of the actual 
program and require support from other departments um, or people that specialize in that with, within the university. Um, so, so maybe be prepared that you might have a guest speaker come in um, to help teach you some of, some of those strategies. I know that's the way that, that uh, we have it at UNCG. We have a special guest speaker that comes in and teaches different strategies. Um, but given where you are right now in your journey, I think asking that question of programs is a great idea. Yeah, so we had a lot of questions submitted ahead of time. Um, one of them was about NSGC. And with this last year, NSGC was fully virtual. And just recently, I think it was yesterday, uh, was announced that it's going to be fully, fully virtual again this year. Um, so traditionally, usually students in the second year attend NSGC, but um, someone wants to know if that's shifting now that it's virtual and costs are much less to attend that. If um, maybe Rachel, you wanted to you know, start answering that question in terms of what students are planning on doing in your program. Yeah, so I'd be happy to answer that. And I will provide a little bit of a, an acknowledgement here real quick. Um, last year, I was part of the annual conference program planning committee. I was the chair of that committee and was um, very involved with the planning of the first ever virtual conference. Um, and I'm currently the vice chair of the education committee. So I'm still really involved in that. So just want to clear the air on that as I share my perspective. Um, you know, I think that I would not be surprised if we see more programs um, and more genetic counselors in general choose to do the virtual option. Um, I think the plan is for us to continue having a hybrid option, even once the world gets a little bit more normal than it is right now. Um, I think that there's, there's immense value in students actually going to NSGC because of the opportunities to meet folks and, um, and just experience being a genetic counselor among thousands of other genetic counselors. Um, I know our plan, uh, we're still working out the details of what our plan will be for this year, considering that they just announced that we're moving virtual. But last year, what we did, um, we had planned um, class days around some of the sessions that our students were most interested in or that we as faculty thought would be really important for the students to attend. And so we, we were actually able to be in person together on campus last year because of the rules at UNC Greensboro. So we were all in a big room together, streaming it um, on the big screen in the room. And it created this sense of like camaraderie and connection that you kind of get at the conference. Um, but we were able to do it there together in person, distance from everybody else. Um, and I think they're still working out what the platform is going to look like. But last year, there were some really amazing virtual conversations that were happening through some like online chat room type of things that were part of the um, of the conference platform. So if that happens again this year, I definitely encourage students to get into those rooms to have those conversations um, to help you feel a little bit more connected to the profession. Um, than you might otherwise, considering that we're all going to be at home or, or in our offices this year attending NSGC. It's interesting, the question about whether, like, moving forward, right, like, our first year is going to be allowed to go. Um, we've had one or two go, but that was simply because they had a poster that they were actually presenting. Yeah, so I actually um, was, when I was in my program, the NSGC was five minutes away from, it was in Anaheim, where which was five minutes from where I was when I was a first year. So all of us actually went as a first year. And I have to say that it was so inspiring. And, the, and unfortunately, that was partly probably because of the, the networking opportunities and being in person. But um, I think that it can be so beneficial. So for anyone listening that doesn't know what we're talking about, the NSGC is the National Society of Genetic Counselors. There's an annual conference that is specifically geared to genetic counselors where people come from all over the country and actually probably the world um, to learn about you know what's going on, the newest, latest, greatest uh, research and topics in genetic counseling. And so this year it is virtual again, which has been disappointing for some people, but it is, you know, better, you know, safety wise, which is why it's been changed. But 
also it will allow, I think, a lot of people who would, weren't able to travel for many different reasons to be able to attend. Um, and we're kind of talking, the, what has been mentioned is that in the future going forward, instead of just being in person, it will be both in person and um, virtual, and you can choose which one. And I think that uh, one of the big barriers to people attending is travel and is, you know, leaving your family, leaving um things for that amount of time. And so I, I think for first years and for anybody who's a practicing genetic counselor can be very, very helpful to, to attend digitally or virtually. Um, so I don't know, I just wanted to give my input as someone who went as a first year it was it was overwhelming, but I think it was also very inspirational. Yeah. And something that I was just thinking about Janelle, as you were talking about how packed the first year is uh, with curriculum and things, I, I think it could be really interesting if if um, faculty get the schedule for the conference early enough to sub in some of the lectures that you would have during your regular uh, your regular curriculum. Maybe let some of the NSG talk cover that content because we're hearing it from the experts, the people that are like on the cutting edge doing this work that are in the clinics, experiencing these things, which is one of the things that I love most and get most inspired um, whenever I buy, whenever I go to NSGC is just seeing other genetic counselors that are doing such cool stuff. Um, and it is, it's so fun for people who are just like lifelong learners <laughs> and who are always interested in like learning what the latest and greatest is which you kind of have to be prepared to do as a genetic counselor, right? Um, so I, I would love to see the opportunity going forward for more first years to maybe attend virtually and then having the second years be able to go to the in-person component to be able to do some of that networking stuff. I remember the first year I went to NSGC, I actually had a job interview while I was there was really stressful. Don't recommend doing that. Um, but it is a lot of fun to get to meet people, especially as you're job searching and things like that. Our next question is about thesis projects. Um, this is something that I think can be a little bit mystifying. Um, it's not, from my experience, it wasn't really talked about a lot during interviews and during the application um, cycle. And you get to grad school and you're like, okay, how is this thesis project going to work? Um, so Janelle, did you want to talk a little bit about just the timeline for thesis projects, what that looks like? Sarah Lawrence is a little bit different from a lot of programs in terms of having groups. Let's start from um, how projects, I guess, are selected, if I, if I can even say. It's really more like a match. Laura Hersher is essentially collects a lot of these projects, creates a list. And um, there are some people who come in and already know what they want to do. And, and, and that's fine. You can do that. But for everybody else, because the majority are, is everybody else who don't know what they want to do necessarily, she has a great pool of ideas and topics to choose from. And so because most research does not happen as an individual, most research is done collaboratively with multiple people. And so the idea is to mimic that, to mimic what's happening right now. And so you'll have people who work in pairs, people who work in groups of three, the largest we have is groups of four, and and that's that's actually rare. So the vast majority of projects have two to three people, and um, you essentially rank them, kind of like <laughs> kind of like match. You rank your your top three or four, and then she takes her time to really make sure that everybody gets you know something in their top three because she wants to make sure she understands that this is going to be a long time that you're going to be working on this. She wants to make sure that you actually care about and like what you're working on. So that essentially is how the the projects are, I guess, matched. Like that's how you're matched with your with your topic. And then included with that is also a mentor. So whoever whoever's project it is is that's also the person who who will mentor you. So. Um, they don't. It doesn't even necessarily have to be just in the New York area, um, although that's where where we are. But there could be. It could literally be across the country, or even in Canada. We've had that as well. In terms of timing, Kira, I'm the projects are matched around. I would say like 
I think it was like second semester spring. Of yeah, first I think it was year. Valentine's Day when we found out what our thesis oh, was project Valentine's was. <laughs> For yeah, me, I, I don't know. Say, Maybe it's, it's definitely spring. Yeah, I just can't remember how far in spring. And that keeps changing as well. <laughs> so it's, but it is in your spring semester of your, of your first year. And you can start working on it. Sometimes there are projects that have timelines that need to like immediately get to work. You need to get things done because during the summer, you're already going to be collecting data. And there are some people like that, and then there are other people who have time, and so they're kind of like preparing for things, and then they really start working on it during the summer. But no matter where you are, um, when you come back in the fall, that's, I think, the vast majority of people are now starting to collect their data and begin to write their manuscripts near the end of the fall semester, because by the time spring semester comes, everyone should have completed writing right before spring break. Yes, that okay. I was thinking through and I'm like, yep, that's how all of those things happen for me. Um, and yes, yeah, spring break, um, that's that's when COVID hit for my class. So oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, some of us are a little bit behind there. But um, I, I really enjoyed working in a group with thesis. Um, I had one other partner. And to me, it was so much easier because we could figure out, okay, I'm going to do this, you're going to do that, helping out each other. I think if I was doing it by myself, I would have been a bit overwhelmed. But and it also means when you're in a group, you get to take on a little bit of a bigger project because you're not doing it alone. So at first, I have to say, when I was interviewing at Sarah Lawrence and I heard it was groups, I was like, oh, I don't know, do I want to do a group thesis? I was like, at first, I was like, this is kind of on my negative side for Sarah Lawrence. But I really came around to it and I can't picture doing my thesis the other way. Rachel, how about, you know, for your program, is it similar to that, different? It's somewhat similar, and like I'm the research and capstone coordinator, so this is all I do, and I could talk. This is your bread and butter, right here, Rachel. This is not bread and butter, but I'll I'll make it brief. Our timeline is very similar to Sarah Lawrence. Um, We do expect that our students have kind of their research, their research question proposal towards the end of spring semester, their first year. Um, The data collection for us starts a little bit later, so. We're pushing them to do like IRB and things like that over the summer um, to get approval to be able to do their research. So data collection tends to happen in the fall. Um, I also think that that is typical of a lot of programs just based on the number of invites to research that go out on the National Society of Genetic Counselors research list or mailing list that they have. We tend to see a ton of research requests going out in the fall. Um, And then we also have a capstone process instead of a thesis process, which means that um, our students don't have to defend their project. Um, Their final product that they provide is a manuscript that is ready to be submitted to a journal. Um, And it provides a little bit of flexibility in the type of projects that they can do. So um, our students can do things that are a little bit more creative or that are education or community-based projects. The one that I always like to highlight, we had a student that wrote a children's book about girls with Turner syndrome experiencing infertility. Um, And that was her capstone, was creating this children's book. Um, But our students do things, do the projects themselves usually, um, and they come up with the ideas themselves. through brainstorming with me and the other program faculty. Yeah, that's and interesting also, having a capstone with that. You just yeah. have more flexibility with it. And you said for those that are doing more of a capstone that's kind of in the thesis realm that they're writing it so that it's ready to be submitted to a journal. It's in that format already. Yeah, so we I encourage students to write it in the format of Journal of Genetic Counseling since that's the journal that the majority of genetic counseling research is published in um, so that technically they could submit for publication before they graduate. Um, I haven't had anybody take me up on that offer just yet in the three years that I've been in this role, Um, but hopefully it'll happen soon. Do you know how nice that is to just have it ready? Because I have to say, as someone who had to write a thesis, it's very hard to convert to a manuscript. I still haven't done mine and uh, I, I will, but it's been like six years, so we'll see. Um, I just wanted to also mention that every program is a little bit different. So the um, what was discussed 
tonight is representative of these programs and and they're all like they all share a lot of common themes but they're all they are a little bit different so if you're entering into a different program it may be a little bit different um i don't i actually had never heard of this group research is sarah lawrence the only one that does that or are there other programs i'm not sure out of the seven programs i interviewed with um that were all like northeast kind of new york based around here um that's the only program i remember it bringing up group projects, but that's an N of seven. So that's not quite the 40 or whatever (laughs) programs there are now. All right. So our probable last question tonight here um, is just asking about classes in the first year, what types of topics are covered in that? And we're almost coming for full circle because at the top of the conversation here, we were saying how to prepare for getting back into the mindset of taking classes. And maybe it will be helpful for some students to just know what are some of those topics covered? Yeah. You know, I think this is Unfortunately, a program specific question, um, I can share what we do at UNC Greensboro. So at UNCG, the first semester classes include a, an introduction to research and genetic counseling literature course, which I teach. Um, it includes a kind of an intro to genetic counseling. So learning some of those counseling skill sets. Um, we have a genetics in the community course where our students get to meet individuals and families impacted by genetic conditions and get to learn a little bit more about the community of Greensboro where we where we are Um, and the second semester they take uh, their first medical genetics course um, another research course they get to choose the research methodology course that they like to take I know that that's very different from other programs that actually will start medical genetics on day one um and we kind of ease into some of the the medical genetics things and start that in the spring semester so it really is dependent on the program that you're a part of um i i do feel like the majority for and this is across all programs is really laying the foundation and teaching you the core skills that you're going to really need to be able to start in your clinical rotations um so it's going to be a lot of familiarizing yourself with the field of genetic counseling, kind of what we do, and teaching you those really basic skills, things like collecting family health history, um, some really basic counseling skills, uh, pretty much preparing you to enter that first clinical rotation. Yeah, it was pretty similar, my experience at Sarah Lawrence. Janelle, did you want to shout out a couple of classes in the first uh, year of grad school? Fundamentals in genetic counseling, human genetics, genomics got embryology i'm going back to my calendar i'm like what classes yeah, did I have three years ago <laughs> um, embryology yeah. and then cancer and repro but that was in your spring semester dina yeah. do you do you remember like what types of classes you were taking the first year it's been a while um i know that they like uc irvine it's been our long for it's been around for so long that they actually changed uh, they change it up, you know, to adapt it to what they think is working every so often. And I think they changed it a little bit um, after I left. But I remember, um, I think, those fundamental courses as well. And we didn't we had our community genetics, um, which really the second year. And we did a lot of um, classes with med students in the medical school the second year as well, which was really fun. My experience at University of Colorado was quite similar. The only thing that I haven't heard mentioned that I remember having for a first semester class was um, introduction to interviews where we just practice like taking pedigrees and kind of like a more of a laboratory kind of class where you were, I don't know, practicing your interview skills as a genetic counselor. But those community-based classes sound cool. I didn't know that was part of any program. I didn't have anything like that. Going back to the advice that I provided Noah, I think if you are in the stages of considering applying this year or next year, that's also an important question that you'll want to ask is um, the courses that are taught, you know, what is the general content? Um, You know, maybe that community and genetics course is something that you feel would be really important for you. And Catherine, I imagine that a lot of that information was embedded in other courses, um, which is a reminder that any program that's credited by ACGC 
is giving you the information that you need to be a successful genetic counselor. It just differs in the way that it's delivered. It's differed in how it's packaged. If at any time you felt like, oh no, I don't get, I don't get this at my program. Don't worry. You probably do. It just might be called something a little bit different than what we've talked about. I love that. I think that's so important to remember is that all the programs that are certified and credentialed are going to be giving you what you need. I think that's super, a really great quote we should use to uh, promote this club. So this is the Genetic Counseling and the Future of Healthcare Club on Clubhouse. We are doing weekly talks on all things genetic counseling, everywhere from uh, maybe certain conditions in genetic counseling to uh, applying and being a, a grad student like we talked about today uh, to private practice genetic counseling and, and other um, other just topics that are important for genetic counselors and prospective genetic counselors. And then follow us. Everybody on stage has just really a wealth of information to share. Um, you'll be seeing the same people on stage for different talks. There's a great community on both Instagram and Twitter that um, we can keep this discussion going. I know Kira was live tweeting during this session as well. I have one last thing um, that was on my checklist of things that I wanted to share with y'all. And I should have done this earlier. It, it made sense in response to the first question, but I didn't want to like give all my stuff away right at the <laughs> beginning. One of the things going back to Alejandra's question about like how to get back in the mode of studying and like Kira's response about you'll fall back into those routines of studying. Um, I might suggest that your routines of studying from undergrad were not the most effective. Um, and I strongly recommend that you all check out the book called Make It Stick by Peter Brown, Henry Rodiger, and Mark McDaniel. It actually provides strategies for learning that's based on empirical evidence from research related to memory. And so one of the interesting things that I learned from that book is doing things like reviewing your notes, rewriting or copying your notes, highlighting things in a book are not actually effective about like having things stick in your long-term memory. Things like quizzes or flashcards are actually better for doing that stuff. And so as you are getting in the thick of it, starting to try to retain all this information that you're going to get over the next two years, I encourage you to consider strategies that are really going to help you uh, make it stick, if I could be cliche there for a second. Um, and think about working with some of your classmates to set up a Quizlet or to share flashcards or something like that. Um, and consider the ways that um, you can really learn the information that's going to help you retain it, because you're going to have to come back to this for boards. You're going to have to come back to this once you're in practice. Um, so you don't want to just memorize it for the exam. You you really want it to, to hold fast into your me memory so that you can retain and use it regardless of where you are in the future. So check that book out. It's a, it's a wonderful resource and it will probably disrupt everything that you previously thought about your studying skills. So that's my, as the professor here, that is my assigned reading for all of you uh, for today's class. Thank you very much. Make it stick. All right. I, I like Make the title stick. of it too. It, it, it sticks in your brain. We're just going to keep going with these puns. <laughs> That's so interesting. I can't wait. I wish I had that when I was in grad school. Or even studying for Me boards, too. as Rachel was saying too, because that was like yeah. the biz biggest exam of my life. And I know some people are you know, still taking that exam uh, this weekend. It's the kind of last opportunity in the U.S. for it. So you can go to dnapodcast.com. That's really the hub for all of my information. Um, if you're interested in listening to genetic content like today, uh, you can search DNA Today on your podcast app. Uh, we're also on YouTube if that's your preferred platform. Um, so go to dnapodcast.com to find that. And we're going to have a link to make it stick because that's Rachel's recommendation. So I'm going to have a link to that. I mean, you can find me on campus at UNCG all the time, <laughs> but as far as the as far as the internet goes, um, I am on Twitter. My handle is double helix tat because I have a tattoo of the Watson and Crick double helix um, figure from their original paper. So that's where I stand upon my soapbox the most. I'm also often here on Clubhouse hanging out with Dina. 
Oh my god, I thought the tat was uh, an amino acid. I mean, that <laughs> it's that too. It can be all of the things. <laughs> That's so funny. What a clever, like, double meaning. I love it. Um, thanks, Rachel. Katie. Hello, guys. So you can follow me on YouTube. I've got two different YouTube channels. The one that's more about genetic counseling awareness is Katie Lee CGC Talks Genetic Counseling. But I also have one if you're interested in reproductive medicine, and that's Katie Lee CGC Talks Fertility and Miscarriage. And I'm on Instagram as well at Katie Lee CGC. Awesome. And you can find me. I'm Dina DNA. That's D-E-N-A DNA um, on pretty much every social media platform. But focusing now on TikTok and Instagram. I think we shared so much tonight and I hope that we answered everybody's questions and just made them feel more comfortable about either uh, applying to grad school, starting it, continuing it. Um, you know, it it honestly was such a cool, great experience and I, I miss being a student all the time. Um, so just soak it in. It can be stressful, but it's also so fun and inspiring to be learning genetics all the time. I mean, that's why we're all in the field. So I hope you guys just end of the day, have so much fun with it and definitely reach out to us if you have questions. You can send those questions into info at dnapodcast.com. We would love to connect with you on social media. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. And I wanted to recommend a couple episodes of the show especially episodes 87, 97, and 101. These episodes, you can learn more about applying and starting grad school. They're going to be linked in the show notes to this episode and the blog posts that are all available at dnapodcast.com. Wanted to give a shout out for the Genetic Counseling Virtual Career Fair because this is totally up your alley. It's on September 28th and September 29th. You're going to have an opportunity to find information about a career in genetic counseling from the National Society of Genetic Counselors and visit with over 50 master's level genetic counseling training programs in the U.S. and Canada. If you are a prospective student interested in genetic counseling and of a minority background, they will also have a minority genetic professionals network room where you can talk to minority genetic counselors and students. Link in the show notes to access the genetic counseling virtual career fair there. And thanks again to our listeners who got us nominated for the best 2021 Science and Medicine Podcast Award. If you nominated us, please check your inbox to see if you are one of the people randomly selected to vote for the show. I was this year and received an email on August 9th, so I would expect it would have come in around that time. So please pause the show now, check to see if you got the email, and if you did, please go ahead and vote for DNA today. We need all the votes we can get to defend our title as the best science and medicine podcast. Thanks for listening. I am Kira Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Thanks for listening and join us next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. DNA.